What's up, y'all? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tonight we have our first Adventist who wants to step up to the answering Adventism plate. Let's give him a round of applause, shall we? Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He is going to be giving his best pitch from Scripture for us on why Satan is typified by the Leviticus 16 scapegoat. For those that do not know, the Adventist Church teaches that the atonement is still going on. Now, they don't mean the same thing by atonement that we do. They kind of lump some things in there that Christians uh, do not. Uh, different discussion for different time. Maybe it will come up tonight. Who knows? Um, but they still think the atonement's going on. Christ is still dealing with sin in a sanctuary building up in heaven. And at a point in the future, he will transfer the sins of those who make it through the investigative judgment onto Satan, who is ultimately responsible for them. So it is a part of their broader investigative judgment and sanctuary doctrine, if you will. Here's how to work. He will have up to 15 minutes, if he needs that much, um, uninterrupted to present his, again, best case from scripture. And then we're going to examine this afterward and see how it holds up. Jonathan, welcome to the show. You will, or the timer rather, the timer will start uh, when you first begin talking. So let me get that going here. Anything you'd like to share with the audience, feel free to share. Um, but like I said, um, once we're ready to go, I'll let you know. And then once you start talking, um, the timer will begin. Anything that you'd like to share, sir? Okay. Thank you so much for um, the great opportunity to share my opinion on this scapegoat. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, I don't need any Adventist book or anything because as I grew up, and be, um, decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. I've learned my way through from research of him by researching my information from external sources. If the information is true, then I don't need what Adventists are saying. It doesn't really matter. The information, the information is still true. So let's go. Let's go in and then look for. All right. Um, what a scapegoat is. Yep, I will. Uh, I'll bring up your presentation here, and like I said, once you begin talking, sir, I will start your time. And once you have one minute left, I will give an announcement that you have one minute left. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you once again. Um, um, today we'll be discussing about the Leviticus sixteen, verse one to thirty-four a concept that has been placed in, in scripture to tell us the plan of God's salvation and how he's going to deal with sin and um, how are we going to be forgiven and at the same time, how he's going to eradicate sin from the earth as we see. Um, from Leviticus 16, I'll just go through uh, uh, slide by slide so that we'll get a concept. Um, first, before we can, we we go in, we have to know what atonement is. Atonement is so to compensate for a wrong. We, we are in, that this is for, this is from a dictionary explanation. We were unable to get satisfied from the local stores and uh, expiation and then satisfaction. Uh, to make an amendment. So in other concepts, uh, we can say an atonement is to make the children of God one with their father because sin was the one preventing them from becoming one again with Christ, with God. So in order for God to make atonement for us so that we can, we our sins can be forgiven and then we becoming, we becoming his children again, he has to what? Um, make sacrifice for us and atone for our sins. And then we, once our sins have been forgiven, then we can become one with God again. Um, let's go on. And then this is an online, uh, this is chat GBT, I check. And then it says in broader context, without any Bible explanation, what, what best way can I understand 
atonement. And it says that it just is refers to that an act of reconciliation, making amends for a wrongdoing or cause damage. So let's go on. So we can get this uh, concept from Levitical system. And then once we go through, we we'll get to understand what each thing really means. We have, uh, uh, this is a summary of the scriptures that I just took. So verse three says that, Iron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a bull, of a young bull as a sin offering, and of a ram as a burnt offering. So the young bull and the young bull is for sin offering, and then the, the ram is for burnt offering. And then verse 5 it says that, and he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of good as sin offering, and one ram as burnt offering. So here we have two. Uh, another animal classification one is for burn offering and then the other the two case of gold are for sin offering so Aaron shall make offer shall offer the the bull as sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house and then um verse 7 he shall Take the two goods and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lot for the two goods, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. The Lord is cast on the two goods. One is for the Lord, that is the Lord's good, and then the other one is for Azazel, the scapegoat. That one is not for the Lord. And Aaron shall bring the two goals on which the Lord, the Lord's Lord fell and offer it as sin offering, but the goat on which the Lord fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and let it go into the wilderness, into the wilderness, right? The goat for Azazel is never sacrificed. It has None of it blood, none of it carcass or anything burned on the altar of God. This goat is presented alive and sent away. And we should, the best way we can learn this is to, this are symbolic representation of the actual realm of uh, how God is going to deal with sin. So the other Bible translation that use the word as is the, instead of the scapegoat, we have the New American Standard Version. We also have the English Standard Version, and then we also have New Revised Standard Version. All of these Bible versions, they use the word as is the, instead of the scapegoat. So we've, we all know that instead of using scapegoat, we can use the word as is the, and it's cool. So the good for the Lord is offered as sin offering, but the good for Azazel is not, not for the Lord. Atonement is made upon it and sent alive into the wilderness. So, and then we'll now go to verse 11. And Aaron shall bring the bull, the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his household and shall kill the bull the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself. So the 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 one, some of the animals are being used for Aaron and his family, and then the others are used for uh, the the goat is used for the whole house of Israel. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people of the people. Bring it blood inside the veil do with do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before this the, and before the mercy seat he so he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression for all their sins and so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remain among them in the midst of their uncleanness. The main purpose of 
the atonement is to clean the sins of the people and to reconcile them to God. And the law and the Lord's good was used to do the atonement for their sins. Then verse 17, there shall not be, there shall be no man in the terminal of meeting when he goes into the he goes into to make atonement in the Holy Spirit until he comes out that he may make the atonement for himself, for his households. And now verse 18, and he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and make and, and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar. So we here we learn that the the one of the goat that the which is for the Lord was used for the atonement for the people. So the other goat is has nothing to do with the, the forgiveness of sin of the children of Israel. It has its own purpose because God is the one who over, uh, supersedes all these things. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with the finger seven times, cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And then verse 20, and then he has, when he has made all, he has made an end to the atonement for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live gold. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the Head of the live goat, the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgression concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of an able man or suitable man. The goat shall bear the iniquities of the children of Israel. All right. So, in other for us, so the good for us, the good is alive. It has is is never killed. The conf, confess over it all the sins and iniquities and transgression of the children of Israel. I put on it, putting them on the head of the good. The good shall bear on itself all their iniquities to the, an inhabitable land, shall be released into the wilderness. So they are the point. So who is Azazel? So an Azazel is a is a fallen angel. How do I come by that conclusion? These are secular information. You can free of information online. Whoever wants to know what Azazel means can just go and then look for it there. So in my dictionary, I, I had this um explanation in the bible the evil spirit in the wilderness to which the scapegoat was sent on the day of atonement so this is an evil spirit the other trans uh, the other meaning of it is here the the demon or the place in the wilderness to which the scapegoat is released in the day of atonement the scapegoat itself so this is has nothing to do with god or um uh, Jesus Christ or anything, this has to do with what um, the evil spirit or uh, the demon. Again, this this is a continuation from uh, my Bible search, uh, my the name search for Azazel. So. In the Bible, the name Azazel, a Hebrew word, appears in association with the scapegoat rite. Name presented a desolate place where the scapegoat bearing the sin of the people was sent during the end of the second temple. This association, as this was as his association as a fallen angel responsible for introducing human to forbidden knowledge, it made due to Hellenization. Right, so. This is a fallen angel and has nothing to do with uh, uh, Jesus Christ. So um, through my search, I also had this uh, uh, scapegoat ride from the 
so-called uh, Enoch, Enoch scrolls, and then it says that Enoch portray portrays as well as responsible for people for teaching people to make weapons and cosmetics for which he was cast from heaven. The book of Enoch. Eight one two three. I've never read that. I had the information here. And others are taught men to make swords and knives and and show them breastplate and make known to them the metal the metals of the metals and the act of working them. Right. And then this is from the Acap uh, apocrypha. And then um, it also depict Satan as falling, fall of the angel, the biblical story located on Mount, on Mount Hermon. Mm -hmm. So from here, we can, we can deduce that Azazel represents Satan and Satan was a fallen angel. So from careful reading of scripture from Levitical system and looking for words and not just putting our own mind into what scripture is trying to tell us we, re we, re we realize that on the day of atonement is concerned about the forgiveness of sin of the people of israel animals that were used were sacrificed and were killed the blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat and part two is that azazel is a demon and a fallen angel who is that fallen angel and the answer is satan the good for Azazel is not killed. Satan is still left free up to this day. And God promised that he will destroy him in the final day. And that's what scripture is teaching us. The animal is sent to the wilderness and Satan is still left there. Sin are kept on the head of the good of God. One minute. All right. Sin is re reunited with Satan because he is the, he is the cause of lawlessness is from him reserved to be destroyed in the last day. So we cannot say we cannot uh, why Christ cannot be the scapegoat is that Jesus Christ was what he died for our sin. He wasn't alive to do that. He shed his blood. This good as is a blood was never shed. And as the name suggests, the name represents Satan and a demon. Because the Bible specifically states that the goal is for Azazel. So it is it is illogical to say that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the, the devil or Azazel. Thank you. All right, my man. Thank you. So with that said, let's do some inspection on this. Um so you said, well, a couple of your, your primary points. Um, let's start with this. Leviticus 16.5, I'll, I'll bring it up here because I have a, a e-sword. So Leviticus 16.5 says, so you mentioned this, and he shall take, from the congregation of the people of Israel, two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Yes. Leviticus 22, 20 through 25 says that all animals used in offerings had to be blemish free without defect. This would yes. include this. This would include the scapegoat. Is Satan blemish free? And I'll preface by saying before you answer, because you said this multiple times. I'm not claiming, Christians are not claiming that the scapegoat was a sacrifice. Sacrifice and offerings are different. So it was a two goats for a singular sin offering. One of them was slain, which paid the penalty for sin. The other one had a different function, but the two together served as a singular sin offering. So because Leviticus says that all offerings, not just sacrifices, but offerings, have to be blemish free, does Satan fit the bill for that? Well, um, God could have decided to forgive man's sin without even doing sacrifice. That's my opinion. But if he decided to uh, say that we have to present animals to, be, to make atonement for our sins, and the animal has to be blame-free, it is an opinion to God alone. So 
to say that whether Satan is blameless free or not blameless free, he wants to present a concept for us to know that this is how I'm going to do it and this is how I'm going to uh, uh, forgive people's sin and eradicate sin and destroy sin, reunite sin with the one as he reunites sin with the devil, he's reuniting the people that he has forgiven their sins with him. So grouping Satan and sin together reserved for the day of uh, uh, destruction. So whether the animal is blameless free or whatever, it is an opinion known to God. It's not known, it's not something that we should uh, put in mind to it that, oh, the animal is blameless free. So it should be, it should be the son of Jesus, uh, the son of God. Well, you didn't answer the question. God says in the, the Levitical law system that all sacrifices and offerings have to be blemish free. So if you're saying that the antitype is different than the type, well, in the type, it had to be blemish free. It had to be a blemish free goat. But in the antitype, well, that doesn't really have to port over. Um, well, <laughs> Satan doesn't fit the bill yeah. of, uh, uh, of that, which this is the same parallel that we see in Leviticus 14, by the way, folks, you can check this out. Leviticus 14, one through seven. Similar process, and this isn't the only one. There's actually another one as well for molds um, later in the same chapter, house molds, 48 verses 48 through 53. Leviticus 14 has the same thing. You have a singular sin offering, two doves, and it's for the cleansing of diseases. And one is slain, and then the live one is dipped in the blood of the slain one, and then it is set free, representing the disease being taken away from the people. That's exactly what the scapegoat did. So that leads me to my next question. Do you agree with Leviticus 16.10 that says atonement was made on the scapegoat? Atonement is made on the scapegoat. The scapegoat, I, we see it to be, I, we see it to be a, a, a garage a bus or let me say, a bus that carry the sins the sins away, right? So this is this is a a garbage truck. That's the word I'm trying to use. So it we don't we don't need to even move forward without knowing the word what Azazel means or the escape goat means. So if you understand what the escape goat means, it will help you narrate, help you understand what these things represent. So it's not up to us to just put to our mind that, oh, um, the, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I, I was saying that after all the sins have been done, uh, uh, their sins have been atoned for, the sins have been placed upon itself. The word mentioned there was itself. So Satan is responsible for the committing, bringing uh, knowledge of forbidden Forbidden now to humanity, he he was a cause of sin, and then the sins have been placed upon him and then sent away. So understanding the word as a result is first point to understand what it represents. So it's not up to us to uh, put our mind into it and then try to manipulate it. Well, I'm not I'm not manipulating anything. So the reason I ask is because your church's own fundamental belief book. I'm going to read this quote and ask if you agree with this, because your church agrees that Satan is a part of the atonement. So, folks, this is from page 369, chapter 24, the investigative judgment, the heavenly sanctuary. I typed this up myself. I have the book right here. You can check this out. It's going to have a small quote from one of their scholars, and then it's annotated where the SDA Bible commentary begins. And this is what it says. If Azazel represents Satan, how can scripture connect him with the atonement? And then in brackets in the book, they have it Leviticus 16.10. As the high priest, after having cleansed the sanctuary, placed the sins of Azazel, who was forever removed from God's people, so Christ, after having cleansed the heavenly sanctuary, will place the confessed and forgiven sins of his people on Satan, who will then be forever removed from the saved. This is where the, the SDA commentary begins. How fitting that the closing act of the drama of God's dealing with sin should be a returning upon the head of Satan of all the sin and guilt that issuing from him originally once brought such tragedy to the lives of those now freed of sin by Christ's atoning blood. Thus the cycle is completed. The drama ended. Only when Satan, the instigator of all sin, is finally removed 
Can it truly be said that sin is forever blotted out of God's universe? In this accommodated sense, we may understand that the scapegoat has a part in the atonement. Leviticus 16.10 With the righteous saved, the wicked cut off, and Satan no more, then, not till then, will the universe be in a state of perfect harmony as it was originally before sin entered. Do you agree with the statement there? That in, in a, that accommodated sense, Satan is a part of the atonement. As I just said earlier, I said, as, as God is one to make his people one with himself by forgiving their sins, he also make, simultaneously makes sin one with the originator. Who is the originator? Satan. Then so that all will be destroyed. In where the, does the in where the does Leviticus where does Leviticus sixteen say that? What verse says? Show us where Leviticus sixteen says that the scapegoat represents responsibility. One, first of all, the word is Azazel. The word is Azazel means that a fallen angel, the prince of, uh, the prince of demons, or yeah. all those that, things. So that, that's going to backfire as well. We'll we'll get to that, but. I'm trying to be patient with you, but you're not really answering the questions. You're kind of just giving your opinion back. Um, and you had 15 minutes to present. So now we're kind of digging into this. You didn't want to agree with the fundamental beliefs book, which says that in an accommodated I sense, guess... yet Satan is, hold on, sir. Hold on. You wanted to say in an accommodated sense, the book does that he's a part of the atonement. You then said we shouldn't really be peeking behind that and, and poking into those things. So that's not really an answer. So you haven't answered really any of the questions so far. You didn't you didn't answer about being blemish free, etc. Now I'm asking you, so I would I would like an answer on this one, a direct answer, because you should be able to show us this. We're supposed to be examining this from scripture. Show us where Leviticus 16 says anything about the scapegoat representing responsibility. I should show you where. First of all, one point, the word is Azazel, never use scapegoat. The Bible, wait for me to talk. The second point is Azazel represent the devil. Then after the sins of the people have been atoned for, Aaron has, is, supposed, is going to put all the sins upon the good on itself. There's good commission is symbolic. That is the point. The thing is that it is the, the Azazel they represent is, is symbolic about Satan and what God planned of how he's going to deal with the whole sin. The atonement, what I'm just saying is reconciliation. As God is reconciling the people of is the people of Israel, he's reconciling sin with its originator to be destroyed, as he's also simultaneously make the people of Israel one with himself. Right. So the text says nothing about the scapegoat bearing responsibility. Notice what you, the verse that you're quoting where you're saying itself, itself. Yes. That doesn't say anything about responsibility. That's the scapegoat yes. bearing that. Hold on, sir. That's the yeah. scapegoat bearing the sins of the people. So you still haven't showed us that Satan is blemish free, thus fitting the, the type and the antitype. You haven't demonstrated for us that the scapegoat represents responsibility. You also didn't want to agree with the Fundamental Beliefs book that says, in an accommodating sense, Satan is a part of the atonement. With that, I was going to ask you if that's the case, and you've mentioned it in your opening. You just mentioned it again right now. You're saying that Satan and Jesus reconcile you to God. Do you believe that Satan is part of reconciliation? I, I didn't say Satan reconciled me to God. All right, that's, that's, what that's what I'm said, asking. I, I said... Whilst the people of Israel are being forgiven, he is simultaneously reuniting sin with its originator. The point is, it's a day of atonement, making one with. Once the people of Israel are make one with their creator, God is also removing sin simultaneously, making sure that sin with its originator are being destroyed in the last day. That's what I said. Yeah, well, no, I was asking you a question because the sin offering is part of what? The day of what? The sin offering is part of the day of atonement. Okay, and what is atonement? You've said in your in your opening, I wrote it down. 
you put up expiation and reconciliation. My man, you guys are saying yes. Satan and Jesus reconcile you to God because Satan expiates your sins. That's what the scapegoat's function was. It was not responsibility. It was expiation. The reason that two goats were needed was because a single goat could not suffice for what was necessary for atonement. You had to have the penalty for sin, which is death, but a second goat was necessary to remove the sins. That's what expiation is. So without both, you don't have reconciliation. You don't have an, a completed atonement. Death is not enough. Just like if Christ would have only died, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, and not resurrected, you don't have reconciliation. You have to have both. You have to have the perfect work of Christ. You have to have the death, burial, and resurrection. You have to have all of it. It's the same thing here. You have to have it all. That's why it was two goats for a singular sin offering. So if you're saying it is Satan, what you're saying is that Satan expiates your sins away, which is necessary to be reconciled to God. So Jesus and Satan accomplished that. My point is, as I stated continuously, I still say it again, if you don't listen. Sin, as God is making one with the people of God, he is also making one the sin with the sin causer, the one who, who brought sin to the world. So Sin didn't God, come in the Jesus, world by Satan. Sin came, sin came into the world by Adam. Romans yeah, 5. By who, it doesn't say by Satan. Who no, but Adam. At, no one caused Adam to sin. Adam did. Adam chose to sin. This is kind of the problem: is Adventists think that Satan so, makes makes so, them sin. So, so you disagree with the Bible, which which says that Satan brought sin to the world? Where? What's the verse? All right. Because we'll go to Romans five, Hold which on. explicitly says that Adam brought sin into the world. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Paul is talking about federal headship here, how original sin spread to all of humanity through one man. Sin entered the world by Adam, not Satan. And how did, sin, how did Adam go to sin? By, by sinning. The, the, my man, the, this, who, this is part who, of the problem with SDA theology is there's so much extra great controversy stuff read in about Satan that the Bible just doesn't say. The Bible has very little to say about Satan. It doesn't say that Satan, the sin entered the world by Satan. I know that you may think it's like, oh, well, that's logical because Satan had to have fallen from heaven. You were just telling us earlier we shouldn't be trying to read into things and we shouldn't be using logic and we shouldn't be, you know, I know it says it has to be blemish for you, but that's up to God. We shouldn't worry about that. Well, now you're trying to read into scripture something that's not there. Show us where the Bible says that Satan is how sin entered the world. Hold on. While you're trying to bring that up, I will have, well, are you going to be quick? I don't want us to lose track of this, but I also don't want to sit here with a bunch of dead air because I got a number of other questions I would like to ask. But I want to get to your other point about uh, the name. That seemed to be a big emphasis for you that Azazel is a demon. And so um, do you have your verse about Satan being 
how sin entered the world? My man, I'll, I'll be honest with you. It's, it's not there. So, is that, so just, just, no, no, it's, it, 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 it's not there, my man. Um, it, it, just, ex, just accept that it, the Bible's not going to contradict what Paul says in, in Romans 5, 12, that sin entered the world by, by Adam. Um, it's just, that, that's a fact. This is like I, a huge, I, this is a huge reason too, because this is the problem. If you think that Satan is ultimately responsible for sin, it creates all sorts of issues because God works through federal headship. God sees uh, the sin of nations, for example. He sees the sins of people groups sometimes. Um, and then also he sees people as rep So like he says in there, if you keep reading in Romans 5, 12 through 14, he says, we read it by sin, uh, the world, uh, sin entered the world through man, through one man and death to all men because all sinned. Well, all of mankind wasn't born at one singular time. So how could all people have sinned? Because God federally looked at Adam as the federal head. This is why the second Adam coming, Jesus, is such a big deal because he did what the first Adam failed to do such that he can be our new federal head and in him we can be seen as righteous. But you can't have that when you don't have a completed atonement and you have uh, Satan being a co-partner with Christ in this. But let's get back to your question here about, or your, your statement about the name. You're really hung up on the term Azazel. Now, my man, are you aware that there are four primary um, understandings of the term Azazel and where they're all coming from? Yeah, I've, I've read through, but... So you know what all, yeah. you know what all four, because the position you're taking on this with the name is, I'm not saying this automatically makes it wrong, but it is the minority amongst the minority positions. It is the bottom because you have to quote apocryphal texts, which is what you did, because nothing in scripture tells you that Azazel is a demon. The translation also, too, that you're referring to when you're saying that some translations use it and some don't, that has to do with the Masoretic text, the Hebrew manuscripts. There are some where there's a punctuation mark on the name and that affects whether it is. Well, we're not going to get into all that. That's why it's interpreted certain ways. So this idea that it's just, oh, it's just cut and dry. It's just a, a figure. You said Azazel is the name of uh, is being used as a name for Satan. So if that's the case, let me read 6 through 10. And instead of Azazel, I'm going to say Satan. Okay? Yes. Because you're saying it's Satan. He says, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and one lot for Satan. And yes. Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Satan shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Satan. So question for you, that last verse, verse 10, if Satan is the scapegoat itself, how can Satan be sent to himself in the wilderness if he is the scapegoat? God is the one who has the supreme power over all things in the world, showing that he so the the good present before the Lord, which is for us as well, shows God's supremacy over how he's going to deal with sin and then destroy it completely. So the Bible consistently tells us God's supremacy over everything, his power over Satan. And then everything. So he is overseeing it, and then making sure that everything is being destroyed. Um, one of the scripture I wanted to bring about, um, which well, hold I, up, I hold really up, hold up. to bring it up. Hold, hold up, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Let's finish yeah, this one. Yeah. Let's finish this one out first. Yeah. Satan shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it. So you should say him. Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over him, that it may, that he may be sent away into the wilderness to Satan. So Satan is the scapegoat who's sent away in the wilderness to Satan. Doesn't work. That's why the translation is scapegoat, because when you see the scapegoat as a function, the goat of escape, expiation, 
the one that takes the sins away, you know, like John the Baptist said about Jesus, John 1 29, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus takes the sins away, not Satan. So when you plug in scapegoat yes. here, it works because it's talking about a function. It's not talking about an individual. It's talking about an individual. So one, one thing about, about this is um, it says over it. So the Bible doesn't consider Satan to be anything. So he used the word for it. So this is this is a kind of a, a it's not like they want to exalt Satan, then give him a proper name. He used the word for it because the, the good represent it represent is it represents Satan showing how the plan of atonement is going to be. Right. Satan's going to bear the sins after Jesus is finished and he'll expiate and take the sins away and then you'll be reconciled to God because your sins will be separating you from God no more. That's uh, blasphemous, my friend. You That's are what you're saying. Blasphemy. One, listen. Listen to my statement. God, the reason why Jesus died is to make people one with him, not Satan with him. So the people are making, God is making uh Jesus is making uh, people one with God, his father. And at the same time, when the sin are being, uh, he's, he's done atonement, atoning for us, he's going to remove the sin and put it on Satan. That's where Satan is going to be destroyed with sin and whoever follows him and didn't uh, accept the atonement he has done for humanity. Um. The only problem Let's with that, read. man, is that's not what the text says. The function of the scapegoat in the text is the removal of sin from the people. If Satan does that because he's the scapegoat, that means Satan, until he removes your sins away from you, you're not reconciled to God. Because Satan, as you mentioned, hold on, Satan, hold on. Satan hold, is hold. Okay, Don't miss cool. okay, so you're muted. That's not how this is going to work. I run the show. You had 15 minutes, and then we were going to discuss. If Satan is the scapegoat, he functions as expiation, because that's what the scapegoat in the text does. That's what Azazel is, the goat of escape for expiation. In your own definitions that you brought up, I wrote it down, you had atonement, and underneath it was expiation and reconciliation. The scapegoat functioned as expiation until that is done you're not reconciled you can't just say well jesus died so i'm reconciled because he died no that wasn't the purpose of having two goats furthermore you need to explain to us sir when lots were cast over jesus and satan to see who would be who when did this action of lots being cast over jesus and satan happen Yeah, done. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. When did the lots get cast over Jesus and Satan to see who would be who? I don't get your question. The text says, verse 8, Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and one lot for Azazel. You're saying that that's Satan. So one lot for the Lord, one lot for Satan. When were lots cast over Jesus and Satan? To see who would be who. Lots were not were never cast for Jesus or Satan, but right there, buddy. It's right there. I'm saying that's part that. of the ritual. Yeah. This is the type. If this is the type, is then. If this is the type, does that port over to the antitype? You can just say that doesn't actually port over to the antitype. There, 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 there were a lot of things that were... Jesus is not just a good... Uh, let me say the, the, the sacrifice that were done to atone for the people's sins is not only a good. Ram was there, Boo was there, and stuff. So this this tells us that... that, that, that um, the the complete difference between the two things. 
So in one aspect, bull, bull, ram, and other things were added to make atonement for the people. And here it's only one kind of animal. One is for one has been done with um, casting of laws and one the Lord chooses and then is part of the atonement to atone for the sin of the people. And the other one is never is, is sent away. And atonement is made upon it, removing the garbage truck to remove the sins from the people away from right. us. So yeah. the same the same way. Um, in the last day, when when uh, we are being atoned for, we are everything has been done completely, and Jesus is coming and then destroy the whole want. Uh, after he has taken his people away, he's going to destroy everything. Because even uh, uh, somewhere in Matthew, it says uh, when he comes, he will separate the sheep, his his people from the others, like a, a, a separate separate sheep from good. So when he separates his what whatever is his, he he casts the rest out. So is the one who chooses to do so. Okay, so I think we've hit that point. Um, that third or fourth point there, um, good enough. We'll let the audience, um, see for themselves. You mentioned the other animals here, that there's a bull for a burn offering, etc. Question, is Jesus the antitypical fulfillment of all of the law's sacrifices and offerings, meaning the sin offering, the guilt offering, the fragrant offering, etc.? Is Jesus the bull there as well, the burn offering? Yeah, it's sacrifice. So everything that is done in the temple of the Lord is for is a prototype for Jesus. Whatever it's, is not in the temple sent away, which blood was never used for atonement or anything, is never for the Lord. Right. The function of the scapegoat again, my man, is expiation. That was the purpose. It was part of a singular sin offering. You're leaving that part out. Both goats functioned as a singular sin offering. You're breaking the sin offering up between two individuals. So I'm asking you, you, you said this is all sacrifices, stuff that took place. Is it only sacrifices? Jesus is only the antitypical fulfillment of sacrifices, but not offerings? Everything done in the temple of God that way used for the temple yeah. of God, okay. where so, sprinkling of blood is for, is for God. Only sprinkling Jesus of blood. Did that. He paid. He paid for our sins, and then he did everything that he could to reconcile us with God. And then, when he's when he's done, he take his people away. He's going to destroy sin. Same thing as we see sent to the wilderness, where everything is being destroyed. So only he's only he only fulfills the things that typify blood. Yes, because the, if there is no remission of, uh, if there is no sharing of blood, there is no remission of sin. So Jesus cannot be the scapegoat because that blood was never shed. Well, you just so said earlier that never. God, you just said earlier God didn't even need to do sacrifices for forgiveness. That was your own personal opinion. That's what you opened with. But now you're saying that yes. the shedding of blood is necessary for remission of sins. So you don't I think said, then that Jesus? Listen, listen. The statement was, is God? God could have. God can choose to forgive people's sins without doing sacrifice. It's his own opinion. But if he decides to do so, he wants to use animals without blemish. He chooses to do whatever he likes. That's what is reserved for God. So you, don't, so you don't think that Satan was the free will offerings or the first fruits? No blood was, was utilized in those offerings? Whatever blood is required, sin. Well, well, the scapegoat does involve blood, my man, um, which is really what I'm I'm trying to get at. You just said that anything that involves blood in, involves Jesus. Well, the scapegoat bears the the sins in the blood and then is is sent out, so it does involve blood for the singular sin offering. Are you asking a question or are you are making a contribution? No, I'm 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 telling you, you you just admitted earlier. I don't think you see it. You just admitted earlier that anything that involves blood, Jesus is the fulfillment of. The scapegoat's blood was not shed, 
but blood was involved. It carried the sins away and it was presented before the Lord in the ceremony as a part of the offering and then bore the blood. So bl the blood of the, uh, of the offering was involved. It just wasn't the goat's own blood because again, a dead goat could not expiate because it was an animal. Jesus is a much better sacrifice. He can be all of the laws and he can be all the laws, sacrifices and offerings in one. The guilt offering, the fragrant offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, etc. He's all of it. Not just if there's blood involved. He's the first fruits. He's all of it. So why are you attributing one aspect of Jesus's completed work? He came to fulfill all righteousness. That would include filling, fulfilling all of the law and the prophets. That would include all of the law sacrifices, offerings, what the prophets foretold, etc. It's all about Jesus. But you're then taking one little sliver and aspect the removal of sin from the people and ascribing that to Satan when that's Jesus's work. Satan didn't remove the sin. It's God who placed the sin on Satan. Yeah, which is what Jesus did in bearing our, our sins in his body on the cross, 1 Peter 2.23. <coughs> God placed our sins onto Jesus. Behold, the Lamb yeah. of God who takes away the sin of the world. He bore them in his body on the cross, and Colossians 1 says that by the blood of his cross, he made peace. Jesus, Jesus is, here, here is the main point. Um, Jesus is, the whole thing about, um, it says that, uh, let me say, uh, Romans chapter, chapter, um, says verse 23, uh, says verse 23, it says, um, Hello? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just letting you finish. Yeah. Okay. In in Romans, Ro, uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, uh, where is my scripture? If you want to share your screen, you'll have to follow that same process I showed you earlier. Yeah. What I'm verse kinda... is it? Romans what? 623. 16. 623. Okay. Okay. It says the main point is it says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the the whole point is um why Jesus is forgiving our sins is because he paid for the price. He paid for the price, he's not bearing sin itself. So that's the main point. Why should I? Why, why do I need to believe in Jesus Christ? Because I sinned. I sinned, and I, I'm, I'm in debt. Six twenty-three. I didn't say twenty-four. No, I, I know. I'm, I'm bringing this up because we're responding to your claim that Jesus did not bear sin when the Bible he, says that. Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Notice the tail end part that we might die to sin and live to righteousness by his wounds. You have been healed. Jesus bearing our sins in his body is what removed them he's, from us. He's bearing, he's, he's, he's bearing the, the word that, that bore there uh, because he used his blood to pay for our sins. That's the cause he's doing to pay for our sins. It's not just uh uh, he's boring sin itself. He's bearing the cause of it, not sin itself. That's the point. He bore our sins in his body. He made him who knew no sin to be sin so that we could be the righteousness of God. Man, this, this is replete in the scriptures. Furthermore, again, Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus takes the sin away. Now, for Romans he's 16... Taking, he's Yep, go ahead. He's take, he's boring the sins of the world because he he's paying the cost, boring the cost. That's the point. So yeah, that's not that's just, death. Uh, this says he himself bore our sins, not just the penalty for sins. It's both. It's not is, an either or. It's a both and. If if I bear the cost of something, I bear it on my pocket or anything. So he bore the sin because he's using his body. Or his blood, which is in his body, he has to share it to pay for the cost of sin. That is the point. So 
Understanding Romans chapter 6, verse 23 will help you understand all these things. Did you say, I'm sorry, I'm having a heart. Are you saying Romans 16 or 6? Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. Yeah, wages, six, yeah, six, six, six twenty-three. Sin is death. Yes. Yeah, I'm, that's it's not a mutually exclusive thing, my my man. It's a it's a both and. Jesus pays the penalty for sin, which is death, while also removing the sins away. He's all of this stuff. I don't see how you can't get it and see it. He's all of it. Why are you making it? Well, he's only this. He can only be this over here. But then, well, he's actually all the other sacrifices and offerings too. But not the scapegoat. I don't know why you you guys are so gung ho on attributing to Satan. Some of Jesus's accomplished work, taking away from the greatness and the glory of the Lord Jesus and ascribing it to, of all people, the devil. Um, I see it to be blessed for us when you, 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 you know very well that Azazel represents Satan and then you attribute it to Jesus Christ. It's so blessed for us. I could never say, I can never say in my spirit that Jesus, uh, Jesus is Satan, which you know that Satan, Satan is uh, the same word as Anas, Azazel. So no, I, no I, I don't. No, I told you earlier, I, I don't agree with that position um, because that's the minority of the minority position because you have to appeal to Jewish apocryphal texts. You know, um, since you're on that right now, do you know what the Jewish Mishnah is? I don't know that. And I, I don't know. I don't know that. The Mishnah is the uh, Jewish rabbis. They're exegetical. Um, it's their exegetical work of the text. It's the Jewish rabbis' official exegesis of the Hebrew text. So I want to look at the Mishnah now, and I want you to see what they say about the scapegoat. Okay? Since you were appealing to extra-biblical sources like the Book of Enoch and these apocryphal sort of texts, let's look at how the Jewish rabbis understand the two Yom Kippur goats. The mitzvah of the two Yom Kippurim goats, this is him commenting on, uh, I can't pronounce the, the last name, but this is the, the commenting on the Hebrew text. Read, it, read the English. I am, I yeah. I, I, don't read, I don't speak Hebrew. Um, the mitzvah of the two Yom Kippurim goats, the goat sacrificed to God and the goat sent to Azazel that are brought as a pair, is as follows. That they both be identical in appearance color and in height and in monetary value and their acquisition must be as one. They must be purchased together. And even if they're not identical, nevertheless, they are valid. And similarly, if he acquired one today and one tomorrow, they're valid. They understood, again, blemish free. They had to be identical. So do you agree with this exposition? Do you think that they understand a little something about the Day of Atonement ritual? And in conjunction I, with Leviticus 22, which says that all sacrifice, well, in that specific passage, all offerings have to be blemish free. Does Satan fit the bill for that? Did they understand what you are saying? I I have watched other Jewish rabbi who also stand with my position. So what they wrote there, it doesn't, it's still, it's still the the controversy we are having here. So it doesn't make a point to me. I said this thing from secular sources and I had my information that the Azazel there is Satan. It's not from SDA or it's not from any person. It's from secular sources. And right. once Satan is Azazel, Satan is the same as Azazel. You can't give that one to, uh, can't say that one is for Jesus Christ or anything like that. I've voiced some writings and I've read even Torah.com, which is for Jewish sites about all this stuff. Yeah, man. Jewish commentators. To, yeah. Jewish commentators. I know are, all this, uh, uh, this these two positions. Sorry for interrupting. It, it's not two positions. There's four positions on this. I asked you about that earlier, and you said you, you knew that. Um, your position that you're saying amongst Jewish commentators is not the normative position. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. Um they are, are, they're saying the same thing that I'm telling you because that's where I'm getting this information from. I'm not just asserting this. The idea that it is a formal name, and it's actually the wilderness demon, um, is coming from Jewish folklore sources as well as apocryphal texts. It is not predominantly coming from Scripture. So the idea that, oh, it's just clear in Scripture that you're calling Satan Jesus. Well, no, it's not, which is why the majority of translations translate it as the scapegoat's function, which is scapegoat. 
So they translated a scapegoat. But now I have another question for you. We're at about an hour here. This should be uh, the, the the final one here, and then we'll we'll wrap things up. Is Jesus still dealing with sin such that it will need to be transferred to Satan? Because think about it. This idea is predicated upon the investigative judgment and the sanctuary teaching. If sin is not still de- being dealt with, and sin has already been dealt with, then that wouldn't mean that there's going to be a point in the future where sin will be transferred to Satan. So is Jesus still dealing with sin such that it will need to be transferred to Satan? Um, the point is we are, we are not yet in heaven. That's the first point. The second point is we are still dealing with sin in our, in our self. And, um, Jesus is still the one who is mediating. Even if he mediates for you, what, how about the child or somebody who, who is here to even hear of Christ to come and then to come and then listen to the gospel? What happened to his sin? So Jesus is still mediating and then officiating over people who, who are willing to confess their sins and then give them up. He'll, 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 he'll atone for them and make them one with God. And then everything will be covered. Um, he will, then they will discard and then destroy the devil with all his angels and sin. And then we are done with everything. So Seventh-day Adventism teaches that you have to confess oh. every one of your sins after making a profession of faith. And that sin is then transferred to the heavenly sanctuary in your record through an angel that's been assigned over you to document this down. And that sin is transferred to the heavenly sanctuary. And when you confess it, Jesus blots it out using his blood. Now, some people will say that's figurative and and yada, yada. But the the point, regardless of that, is the same. The teaching is that Jesus is still dealing with sin, correct? That's what you're saying. I'm not denying confession, et cetera, but that's that's what you're saying. Okay, how does that jive with what we were told, really through the whole book of Hebrews, but specifically, how does that jive with what we were told in Hebrews 9, specifically verse 26, but I'm going to start up at 23. So he's laying down the compare and contrast between Christ and the Levitical Aaronic priesthood. And he is finishing things up from chapter seven here, where he's then going to transfer into the bookend of chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 10. But notice what he says. Thus, it was necessary. So he's now talking about the contrast with Christ. So he talks about how it was on the earthly. He lays out the, the, uh, layout of the earthly holy place, et cetera. And he talks about, uh, yeah, redemption through his blood. And then, Towards the end here, he says this. Thus, it was necessary for the copy of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices, plural, sacrifices than these. That's what I was getting at earlier about Jesus was more than just the uh, sin offering. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as a high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. So unlike the Old Testament Levitical Aaronic priests, Jesus didn't have to do sacrifices over and over and over and over again. He was a single sacrifice. I know you guys aren't saying that there's multiple sacrifices going on. Just laying that out there. And then notice what he says. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Sin was put away in Christ's sacrifice at the cross. He's not dealing with sin anymore. He's not up in heaven doing the Levitical Aaronic priesthood work, but or analogous work, but only in heaven, not on earth. His priesthood is completely different than the Levites because he is a priest king, you're told in uh, Hebrews 7.1. Malachi or uh, Melchizedek was a high priest and he was also a priest king of Salem. So Christ's priesthood is one of not just being a high priest, but a king. So Christ is ruling and reigning right now as a priest king, making all of his enemies a footstool, which is what we're told twice in the book. He's not dealing with sin anymore. Sin was already put away by the sacrifice of himself at the cross, which is why we can actually have a cleansed conscience, the author tells us, unlike the bull, the, the blood of bulls and goats, 
which we're not able to actually take away sin. Christ is actually able to take away sin like the scapegoat such that our consciences can be cleaned. The work of the Levitical Aaronic priesthood was a continuous reminder to the people that their sin needed dealt with. That's what the author tells us. And so if Christ was up in heaven doing analogous work to the Levitical Aaronic priesthood, but only in heaven, your sin's not dealt with. And this goes back to the, the point that I was saying. Satan ultimately caps off the atonement. It's not complete until Satan is involved. It's blasphemous. Uh, you just quote here that um, sin was put away by his sacrifice. He's talking about the sacrifice he did on the cross. And then he said it's finished, but not complete. And no, then he said why the, the, the point was sin is taken away. I didn't say I didn't I wasn't arguing that it not being complete that there's other points we could go to for that. I asked the question, is Jesus still dealing with sin in heaven? You said yes. This says sin was put away at the cross. He died on the cross to get to obtain the blood for the remission of sin. So he 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 got the uh, we have the blood of Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. And then why he's why uh, uh, Hebrews is talking about when he he now entered the holy place to atone for our sins. If it is come, if it is finished and put away on the cross, when he entered into heaven, why is he entering the holy places again? He it says he entered into. Do, it says he doesn't need to enter into any place if that is a point. And the whole book of Hebrews would have been irrelevant of talking about Which, these things. We, we, no, no, the book of Hebrews absolutely decimates this whole entire concept. Um, but we just saw that Jesus entered into heaven itself. That's what the text said. That That's what the holy place is. is, is you, you guys are hung up on this idea of a tabernacle building up in heaven and Jesus is moving around on a throne with wheels and all this other crazy we, stuff. Ellen White said, we, we, um, hold, hold on, sir. Hold on, sir. Hold on, sir. So because you guys are hung up on that, you're, you're missing what's being said. The parallel is that Christ entered heaven itself. That is the most holy place. That's where God's presence is manifest in heaven. That is the holy place. Wherever God is manifest is the most holy place. So Jesus entered one time by the sacrifice of himself, presented himself, was accepted, and sat down on his throne to rule and reign as a priest king. He's not dealing with sin anymore. Furthermore, in your guys' system, because your sin is not actually removed from you yet, Notice what it says. This is after, and we actually need to go back to Hebrews chapter 9, where he says, while the Levitical priesthood work was going on, the way for us into the presence of God was not open. Only the high priest could go in. One time a year at that as well. But now notice the contrast. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. The curtain was the doorway into the presence of God. Jesus is our doorway into the presence of God. The curtain was his flesh. That's what the, the curtain represented. All the temple imagery represented Christ, the bread, the light of the world, etc. Then he says, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. There's no way that this could be possible in your guys' system because your sin is still being dealt with. Just like the Levitical Aaronic priests who were still dealing with sin, people couldn't have assurance. People couldn't actually enter into the presence of God because their sin still stood against them. But because Jesus put sin away at the cross, that single sacrifice, the barrier is broken. The temple veil was torn, contrary to what the Adventist church teaches about the temple veil being torn and the apart that showing the change from the earthly to the heavenly sanctuary. No, it was the barrier between God and man broken down, which represented Christ's flesh. And it's by Christ's broken body on the cross that we can enter into the presence of God with full assurance because my sin's not standing against me anymore. It was already put away. Jesus is not up in heaven dealing with that anymore. Because this is the case, there is no scapegoat in the future for sins to be transferred to. Your, your turn. Uh, um, I mean, I don't know why that's really that funny. Um, it's actually really sad, man, that you guys can't see this. This is you, really serious doctrine. 
you would you would need uh, all these scriptures to talk about uh, your full assurance. But I already I already have my full assurance in um, John three sixteen, which says that um, uh, God has sent His Son to the world, and whoever believes in Him shall not perish and have eternal life. And once I believe, I don't even need to know all this back backdoor processes that is going on. I have the full assurance that my sins are already forgiven. This is this is. Um, uh, uh, complementary information that if you wish to know, but I don't need him to just to know that I still have full assurance when I'm already assured in John 3 16. I don't need all those things. I have the full assurance. Um, you, you, you are like, um, uh, it's like, uh, then time when an Israelite confesses his sins and then on and then. Uh, all these animals have been sacrificed and sent him to, to do all his sins. He, he doesn't know that his sins have been forgiven. Already once he accepts and then he accepts the, uh, accept and put his faith in, uh, transfer his sins onto all these animals. He doesn't need to know all the backgrounds that is going on. Meanwhile, we know that blood has been sprinkled on the mercy seat and all these things to make sure that our our, uh, our sins have been forgiven. But a typical Israel doesn't need to know all this. He has the full assurance right at where he confesses his sins and then all this, uh, all the animal's blood has been uh, killed and sprinkled on the mercy seat. These are after information and he doesn't need to know that once, once he just uh, he transferred his sins already, he knew he's going to be forgiven and that is true faith. He already knew that. He doesn't need any veil to be broken or anything. But this is an after information that if you care to know, if you care to know what is going behind doors, that will help you uh, know how your sins are being forgiven. You will care to know. But if you don't need to know, my sins are already forgiven. And well, you, you, how no, God is you, going you, to deal with them? You can't. You can't possibly know that. For all you know, you could you could sin tomorrow and that will now, if, if it's not confessed, it will be on your record. Because Jesus yes. is still having having to deal with it. Right. So don't say that your sin's already dealt with, man. No, no, it's not. That's where the type breaks down as well, by the way, um, where you, you guys are trying to prove too much from the type antitype from Leviticus. Um, just like how lots being cast over Jesus and Satan ends up proving too much. This is another area where you would end up proving too much with, with what you're claiming because you're you're missing the, the point of, of what the, the type is. This was good. Thank you for coming on. We've been at it for about an hour and 15 minutes. Wanted to go out about an hour of discussion and you had 15 minutes there to open or so. So thank you, my friend. Um, I respect you for coming on here. Seriously, thank you for being um, bold enough to you know state openly what you believe, why you believe it, um, letting other people see. I think it's good for Christians to... Um, hear from Adventists themselves, from their own mouth, the things that um, you guys are, are teaching and believing. So thank you for doing that. Um, I don't know if you have um, like a YouTube channel or anything that you want to tell people about, um, but I'll give you some final words here for you to sign off. And then uh, I'm going to do a, a couple other things before wrapping us up here. So the floor is yours for any final words. Um. I have final words though, but I don't know why you didn't allow me to ask questions. Yeah, you can ask some uh, some questions. I, I We talked about in the thread that you were going to present and then we were going to ask questions about the, the Adventist position because I don't think it's, it's really irrelevant what I believe. I'm happy to answer your questions, like I said, but real quick. Um, it's really irrelevant what I believe because if you nullify what I say, it doesn't automatically vindicate the default position is not that Satan is the scapegoat. <laughs> and then now it's on everyone else. No, no it, the burden of proof is on the person making the positive assertion. And so tonight it was that Satan is the scapegoat. But ask uh, ask your, your questions or a couple here. We're, we'll go for a, a little bit here. But I got a couple other things I want to knock out. Um, what are you doing? Getting a feed from your, your boys? All right. Don't worry. Um, let me just go. You guys need to get your you guys need to get your logistics and your communications stronger. <laughs> yeah, caught you. Yeah, um, yeah. You you guys are funny. 
I I see, I see it too like that. But like, <laughs> let's yeah. let's let's don't worry. Let me do my conclusion. Jonathan, this isn't my, my this conclusion. isn't my first rodeo. I've I, I've been doing this for a, a long time. So I've get, I've get, watched get, you get, get, your, get to your so questions. Yeah, get to your questions. Get to your questions. Um, let me just do my conclusion on my side. Um, okay, my, from, my man, my man, you're, you're going to yeah. sign off for the night. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you. Um, but if you were going to ask questions, you guys should have got your agenda together and had that prepared before coming on here instead of trying to do like the live feed where they're going to like shoot you in the answers uh, and questions and, and that sort of stuff. You guys should have been a little pre better prepared. So do your do your outro. And then uh, if you want to come back sometime and maybe talk about another topic, um, you, you, you can come back. You've been a very nice, cordial gentleman. And so let's give your outro and, and close things out on your end. Okay, thank you. Um, my co conclusion remarks, it is clear, it is clear Jesus Christ cannot be the scapegoat or Azazel because Azazel is a fallen angel. Searching for the meaning of the word is fundamental to understand the Bible. And therefore, a careful search for the word Azazel would have helped anyone who can who want to understand the day of atonement. It represents it represents God's plan and show how he will reunite us with himself and, and completely remove sin from the new earth to come. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Why is it free? It's free because God, Jesus Christ, paid for our sins. And that is a legal process he has done. And he has redeemed us. Redeem, redemption is a legal term to, of freeing slaves. We are slaves to sin. And then Jesus free us from sin. Um, but God showed his love for us in that whilst we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. Since, since therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Romans chapter 8 verse chapter 5 verse 8 and 9 Christ paid for the price of price to free us from the curse that the law that the law in the laws in Moses teaching bring by becoming cursed instead of him instead of us scripture says everyone who is hung on a tree is cursed Christ paid the price so so that the blessing promised to Abraham would have would come to all the people of the world through Jesus Christ and we will receive the promise of the Holy the Spirit through faith. In Revelation, that is uh, Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 to 14. Revelation chapter 8, uh, chapter 5 verse 9 to 10. And by, and they sang a new song, you are ready to take the scroll and to open it still because you have, you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and a priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Acts chapter 8. Hey, Acts my, chapter. My, my man, what? It's not like a full on close. I, I just wanted you to give your, your sign off if people have anywhere that they would you'd like to point them to. If you have a YouTube channel or social media page somewhere, this was not billed as a formal debate. Um, that's not what we talked about in the, the thread. It was for you to present and then for us to kind of examine that. And so any sort of closing words that you'd just like to, to say before. We, we close out things on, on your end. If you'd like to have a formal debate, go to answeringadventism.com and fill out the form and request something like that. We're going to, something like that would require a lot more preparation than, than something like this. And we would want to be on a neutral platform more than likely to have a, a moderator, um, that sort of thing. So um, it, it just any final thoughts you. that you have, if you want I, to point anyone I, anywhere or anything like that. Um, thank you for I being here. Yo, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. I have a channel called Common Sense. Um, where I present my argument after listening to people um, about their opinion about whatever they believe in. 
and I also present my opinion. I'm and I'm grateful for whatever you have uh, you have given the opportunity for us to have uh, a discussion face to face. Um, Facebook I also have uh, the same name, Common Sense, where I present uh, from day to day, assess scriptures and present my opinion. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate it. Yeah, if you uh, met, you have my contact information. If you send me the links to those things, I'll put them in the description box down below. So for people that want to check your stuff out um, or hear any of the you know further laying out of, of arguments and stuff, they can check your channel out. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thank you too. Yeah. All right, folks. Well, hopefully that was beneficial for you to see. Um, you guys can start sending through some questions if you'd like, um, specifically about, um, or preferably about tonight's topic. Um, that was good. That was good. We do this because I want Christians to see from their own mouths what's being said. It's not answering Adventism, misrepresenting them. For all the people, too, who say, you can never have a discussion with an Adventist and be cordial. Yep, that gentleman was very cordial. He didn't come in kicking the door down. He reached out and said, I made a presentation. I want to challenge and present the best case that I can for Satan being the scapegoat. So we set it up and he came onto the channel. So if you're an Adventist and you want to do the same thing this gentleman did, Go to answeringadventism.com, fill out the form that is there and um, make a, a request, you know, in your message. And we can talk about that. Let's look at some of the comments here. I know that there was um, somebody saying, yeah, like this, it should always be the plans to have both uh, cross-examined. This was not a formal debate, folks. This was not billed as a debate. This was billed as he is coming here. And I said this in the opening. It was in the title. It's in the description. He will have 15 minutes to present the best case that he can for Satan being the scapegoat. I didn't even, I wasn't even taking a, a affirmative position tonight. I had a defensive position, um, but I didn't have the affirmative tonight. He had the affirmative and he was coming to present his best case from scripture that Satan is the scapegoat. And then we were going to discuss afterward. And that's what we did. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Is there anything else in chat? Anyone sending questions through yet? Until people start sending questions, if they do have some questions, put a Q if you can, folks, at the beginning of your question, just to differentiate it from the rest of the uh, the the rest of the comments. I want to read something while we're waiting on that. It's from a book here called "Who Shall Ascend the Mountain of the Lord" by L. Michael Morales. Professor Morales is the professor of biblical studies at Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary in South Carolina. And he does a phenomenal job. It's a little bit of a scholastic read here. So if you get this book, you may have to read a little slowly, but he does an excellent job laying out for us what we see through the whole book of Leviticus, not just the day of atonement, not just chapter 16, but the entirety of what is happening here. And I want to read a couple paragraphs here about what he says regarding the expulsion of the live goat, the goat of escape. And notice what he says. Part of the high priest's duties on the day of atonement included taking two young goats and presenting them before Yahweh at the tent of meetings doorway. We saw that in the text to cast lots for them. One designated for Yahweh and the other for Azazel. The high priest would sacrifice the goat whose lot fell for Yahweh using its blood to purify God's house. Upon the head of the second goat, he would lean both hands, confessing over it all the guilt and rebellion of Israel. And then an appointed man would lead the goat, symbolically loaded with Israel's sins, out into the wilderness. Here we are concerned with the second goat, utilized for what many may be, or utilized for what may be called an elimination rite. The term Azazel is problematic and has defied scholarly consensus with regard to its meaning. There are four main suggestions as to its significance. This is what I was mentioning tonight. With some variety within each. One, Azazel either may refer to a demon or to a god of wrath, perhaps even expressing Yahweh's own displeasure via an alter ego. Two, Azazel may refer to a place, a rocky precipice, or the uninhabited wilderness. Three, Azazel may simply mean utter destruction, and four, Azazel may signify the goat that is sent away. 
Rather than weighing in on the merits and weakness of each proposal, I will focus on discerning the significance of the right itself within the theological drama of the cultus. Now that word cultus there, it just means a religious ceremony. It's not a, a it's not talking about like a cult. Uh, I should have marked my place. Whatever the precise import of the term Azazel, the basic significance of the Azazel right is not difficult to discern. The second goat is used to placard the removal of Israel's sin and guilt. Ah, that was the function of the scapegoat, to expiate. In keeping with that understanding, I will refer to the live goat by its traditional ascription, scapegoat, along with Azazel goat, as I make the following two points. First, the scapegoat's role should be understood in conjunction with that of the goat that is sacrificed. As an elimination rite, the Azazel goat ritual is often probed in isolation from the redactional and or comparative religion approach. Within the context of Leviticus 16, however, the rite is fully integrated as part of one complete ceremony. Associated particularly with the young goat that is sacrificed. For example, while two rams are also used on the Day of Atonement as ascension offerings for the priestly house and for Israel respectively, yet these two animals are not brought together in the same fashion as the two goats are. The text is quite careful to portray the goats as a set. This is in line with the Mishnah as well, which says the same thing and says that they also had to be identical, blemish-free, etc., the text is quite careful to portray the goats as a set. The high priest takes them both from the congregation of Israel, presents them before, presents them both together before Yahweh at the door of the tent of meeting, and then casts lots for them both. The instructions for the high priest in Leviticus 16.5, moreover, refer to both goats together as a single purification offering. He will take from the congregation of the sons of Israel male goats as a purification offering. To be sure, the expulsion rite is not an offering in the technical sense, this is where Adventists get hung up because they say, oh, there's no, the scapegoat wasn't sacrificed, so it's not part of the offering. Nevertheless, in removing sin, the scapegoat's function fits the precise significance as purification. And combined with the blood, manipulation of the sacrificed goat completes the picture of atonement. Indeed, there is historical precedent for understanding these goats to be identical in appearance and chosen expressly because of this likeness, as if it were one goat accomplishing two different aspects of atonement, purification and expiation, cleansing from sin's pollution and the removal of sin's guilt. This is why, Seventh-day Adventists, this is such a horrendous teaching. I understand in the sanctuary system, it makes sense in your mind. The problem is there are so many holes in that system. And because the text says nothing about responsibility, which is foundational of this whole thing, by the way, look up all of the mentions of this in Ellen White's writings. You'll never find a single proof text for where she says he represents responsibility. Whether she's doing it in, in context or out of context, she's constantly quoting scriptures. But when it comes to this, no mention. Because there is nothing in the text that says anything about responsibility because that was not the function of the scapegoat. The function of the scapegoat was the expiation and removal of the sins. A dead goat did not remove the sins away from the people. They were still present. They were still there. And the Adventist church has this entire theory of transference. But the atonement was not completed until both goats were utilized along with all of the other animals. Saying that Satan is the scapegoat is saying that Satan and Jesus both accomplish the atonement together, reconciliation, and purification. He even brought it up in his own in own definitions there. And so that's the problem with this teaching. That is the concern. That is the worry, um, because there is a lot of reading Satan into the text when he is not there, um, and reading all sorts of things into the text about Satan that are definitely not there, like we're going to see next Thursday. Next Thursday, folks, you're going to want to tune in for the live stream. We're going deep. 
Adventists, we're talking about the Sabbath. Um, I challenge all of you, show up, listen. And then if you've heard the presentation afterward, you want to come on and try and refute it, not after the presentation, because it's going to be a long presentation. You can reach out afterward. I challenge every Seventh-day Adventist out there, come on Answering Adventism after next week's presentation and try and refute what is said. With that said, let's get into some of the questions on here. Roberto asks, have you looked into Son Sona and what he has written in his talks on the order of Melchizedek? I have not, but I will jot that down. I'm always curious. That's one of my favorite topics to study is the high priestly work and kingly role of Jesus Christ. So no, I haven't, but I will definitely check that out. Um, my library has a pretty big selection of stuff on that, and I'm always looking to add to it. So praise I am asks question, aren't goat sacrificial ceremonies typologies? Why do SDAs describe it literally to Jesus? Um, I'm not exactly sure what your question is. Um, the scapegoat was not sacrificed. So that tends to be a key thing that they try and pour in into their argumentation. I debated pa uh, Adventist pastor Keith Bowman on this. It's on my channel for a month ago. Um, and he basically had the same defense that they did tonight because, well, at the end of the day, that's what the Fundamental Beliefs book says. There's four arguments in the Fundamental Beliefs book, and he uh, mentioned three of them. He didn't mention the fourth point. Um, so one of the key arguments is that the scapegoat was not sacrificed, and so because he wasn't sacrificed, it couldn't have been it couldn't have been Christ. So that's why I asked him tonight. Do you believe that Christ fulfills all of the laws, sacrifices, and offerings? Because there were uh, offerings that didn't involve blood. There was first fruits, for example, which was considered an offering. Um, there was the uh, precious, uh, the jewelry and precious metals that were given in, in a free will offering. No blood is involved. And yet Jesus is the free will offering. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, I, I think you're maybe thinking that they say that the scapegoat was sacrificed. And that tends to be the one thing they want to jump on. Because if you say the sin offering, they associate offering and sacrifices typically as interchangeable. And that's not always the case. And the argument is not that the scapegoat was sacrificed, but that both goats functioned as a singular offering to accomplish a singular thing. And without both, you don't have the accomplishment of that thing. Let's see. This person says, I challenge you. Well, you haven't even heard the presentation yet, <laughs> so calm down. Like I said, you guys can go to answeringadventism.com. You can fill out the form on there and put in your request, and we can talk about all of those sorts of things. But before challenging me, you're going to need to know what I present and what I say, not just assume, which is another problem a lot of Adventists have, is assuming that somebody's going to say something or believe something um, because it's what you're used to. I would hold and cool your horses because... Um, I, I highly, highly doubt you understand what I'm going to be uh, presenting and saying. Tariq Murray asks, resources on the shorter side to learn more about the sanctuary in Orthodox Christianity. Well, it depends what you mean by this, um, because there's a lot of aspects to the sanctuary. Um, so if you're wanting to really go deep, I'm, again, highly recommending this book. Who shall ascend the mountain of the Lord? It is a little bit weighty, but you can do it. You can do it. Um, you just need to go through it slowly with the Bible, because that's basically what he's doing is walking through the book of Leviticus. It is a seminary type textbook. Um, so again, it, it, it is a little weighty, but you can definitely do it. I highly recommend that because the sanctuary is, is littered all throughout Leviticus, obviously, because, well, Leviticus is documenting down the Levitical priesthood work, which took place in the sanctuary. So I would recommend that. Um, but if you have a more specific aspect of that, there's tons of stuff out there um, all the way back from church fathers up through the reformers to people present day. Um, in modern English as well, which is um, always nice, obviously. So that would be my recommendation. Marco asks, can you show from scripture who is the fit man that sends the live goat to the wilderness? Yeah, Simon, that leads uh, the fit man. Simon is, is the, the fit man that leads Christ out of the camp into um, the, the wilderness. Let's see. 
Tedla. How do we understand the scapegoat being led into the land that is uninhabited? So one thing, and this kind of actually goes back to the, the last question as well. This is where you have to be careful with typology, folks. It depends. If, if you try and prove too much, you run into issues. This is exactly why I brought up the question. And it wasn't really rhetorically, but I already knew the answer to it. I was asking the question kind of like Jesus would do sometimes to make a point. Um, you, you can prove too much sometimes when you try to take typology too far. The point of the scapegoat being taken to the wilderness was that it was removing the sins away from the people. That's the point. It's not that, oh man, there has to be a literal wilderness and he's a literal goat. He's literally the Lord's goat. Well, no. And even within the law, there were stipulations for interchanging goats with lambs and, and that sort of thing. So that's how, for example, Christ can be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. I'm glad this gentleman tonight didn't make this argument, but I've heard tons of Adventists make the claim when you try to say Christ is the scapegoat. Christ is never represented as a goat. Well, this is false for a number of reasons, but one, um, he's not the Lord's goat then. That's just a silly argument. But two, Yes, he is. In Genesis 22, the uh, type that we see there between Abraham and Isaac of the father taking the son who carries the wood up the mountain to be the sacrifice. Um, and he says that the Lord will provide a substitute. This is all typological, obviously, of the father giving up the one and only Jesus to be sacrificed and that the father would sacrifice the son. Um, and he was the substitute that was provided. But if you remember in the story, what is caught in the thicket bush? A thicket bush is a thorn bush. It's a ram. That's the substitute that Abraham says the Lord provided in this typological setting right there. That's Jesus, the substitute with the crown of thorns on his head. That is showing, again, this interchangeability of goats, lambs, etc., which was lawful um, amongst the law. So um, I, I say all that to say, uh, I don't think there has to be a literal wilderness. I'm not the one that's drawing out the typology this far. Now, the Adventist church, when they try to do the uh, sanctuary and the investigative judgment, all of a sudden typology becomes super literal. There's a literal tabernacle up there. Oh, but there's not really a curtain with people like Roy Gain. Um, well, he moved from the holy to the most holy, but that was more figurative of a change of work. So this is, again, where typology breaks down when you try to prove too much. And I think it's somewhat proving too much, but also at the same time, um, Christ was led outside of the camp and the, the sins were placed upon him. He bore them in his, in his body on the cross um, and he was led out by a fit man, Simon, um, outside of the camp, the text says. That's in uh, all the Gospels, I believe. Um, maybe not John. I can't remember, but it's in the Gospels. Tariq again, also, how did you become so sophisticated and knowledgeable? Well, um, I stand on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> Don't think that I'm coming up with all these things on my own, that I'm some what have you. Um, I I'm not. <laughs> I'm just a guy who is a nerd about theology. Um, you tend to learn and grow in things that you put time into. That's we're across the board. You know, if you're going to be really good at being a mechanic and cars, you spend a ton of time on cars. This is what I spend a ton of my time doing. I'm super nerded out about theology. I love theology. I want to know why I believe what I believe. That's actually what got me into this sort of thing. That's what led me out of Adventism was trying to really get serious about studying Adventist theology and realizing uh, <laughs> I couldn't do it. <laughs> at least not from scripture. I had to rely on a number of inferences and um, assumptions that come from outside the text, mainly from the great controversy worldview. Um, but it's really just through study. Um, but also too, I have to give really, really, really large amounts of credit to my pastors. I've had sound pastors. Um, my, my, I've, I've said this before on the channel. I'm going to continue to say it. I haven't listed them by name. One of my pastors is actually going to come on it sometime so you can see him then. Um, until then, I'll let them remain unnamed, but they are incredible men of God, godly, studious, serious shepherds of Christ's flock, committed to the text, committed to living out the call of being fit to exegete from the sacred desk of God's church and feed Christ's sheep with the word and be a conduit vehicle that um, the, the word of God is, is feasted upon and then the sacraments administered. Um, I, I owe a lot to my pastors who are so focused on scripture. The preaching is verse by verse by verse through the Bible. We're singing the Psalms in our liturgy. It's just littered with scripture. So through the week, it's meditating on scripture. It's reading scripture with your family. It's catechism with my son. It's, 
when you're constantly just entrenched in this and then doing answering Adventism now full time, but that hasn't been a, a super long thing, but pr even prior to this studying, reading books, um, just soaking up information. It does not come overnight. Um, and again, I, I've been doing that same sort of thing. I, I mean, I've been studying scripture daily um, as well as just theology proper every day for over 10 years now. Um, so that's essentially how, but again, I'm just passing off information that I've learned. That's really where all of this is coming from. It's always been, you're learning from somebody else that is essentially passing this on to you. So that's essentially how. So thank you for the uh, subtle compliment in there as well. Truth Defenders ask, do you see a distinction of the angel of Gabriel between the Jehovah's Witnesses and SDAs? If so, can you explain? Thanks. Um, so I think what you're asking on this, you got to be a little bit more pointed, but that's okay. Um, I think what you're asking is, am I seeing the connection between Ellen White's angel messenger and uh, the way that Gabriel is viewed in the Jehovah's Witnesses? I'm not sure exactly what you mean there because um, we have to be careful when we're comparing what Seventh-day Adventists believe about. I'll use another example with Jehovah's Witnesses like Michael. They don't believe the same thing. And oftentimes, um, to be fair to the Adventists, they get straw manned or caricatured as believing the same thing about Michael that the Jehovah's Witnesses do. And that is not the case. There's an article on this, by the way, on my website, uh, answeringadventism.com. Just go to the Q&A section and uh, click under the Jesus Christ section. And there's one about, is Jesus Michael? Um, and it explains kind of the uniqueness of the SDA position. Um, but hopefully that answers your question. Uh, question, just your thoughts on why the scapegoat is never referenced in the New Testament since it seems to be the most significant of all the Old Testament types in the removal of sins. The sin offering is. So this is kind of what I was getting at with him as well, is that while the scapegoat is not listed by name or uh, like the word scapegoat is not used, uh, sin offering is repeatedly used and the scapegoat was a part of the singular sin offering. I'm going to be doing a series of videos on this because there's just really not enough out there in general on this subject, but also um, it, it is so vital to understanding New Testament language to realize that Paul's not just using pithy language. He's actually, um, well, let's do an example here so I can show you. So Christ is all of the laws, sacrifices, and offerings, all of them. They all pointed to him, the peace offering, free will offering, the guilt offering, etc. So when we're reading the New Testament, these things are being mentioned frequently. And if you're not familiar with this Old Testament law work, you're going to pass over some of these things. So let's use the burnt offering, which was also the fragrant offering, um, as an example of what I'm talking about here. So if we go to Genesis 8, 20 through 22, if you have a Bible, folks, Genesis 8, 20 through 22. We'll see what happens when Noah got off of the ark. And what does it say? It says, then Noah built an altar to the Lord, which is what God commanded him to do, and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. So this is even before the law is, is essentially established with the temple work. We have the same thing happening, a burnt offering. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I'll never again curse the ground because of man for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creatures I've done while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So Noah, after he is spared through the flood, which was also typological, judgment and a, a number of things, he's spared him and his family, eight people, mind you. We're going to get into this a little bit uh, in next Thursday, how the number eight um, represents new beginnings, redemption, that sort of stuff. But they get off the ark. And God commands him, make an altar and take some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offer burnt, all, burnt offerings on the altar to the Lord. So Noah does it. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, ah, he said in his heart, so he was moved by this. 
And he says, I'll never again curse the ground because of man. So he was appeased. He pours out his wrath. That teaches us one thing and, and Noah is spared in the ark and there's a, a ton of imagery there. But then he gets off and obeys God. A burnt offering goes up and it appeases God's anger. And he says, I'll never do that again. And then gives the sign of the rainbow afterward, etc. So now if we go to Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Ah. You parallel that with Isaiah, who tells us the Lord was pleased to crush him. The Lord was pleased to crush the son who willingly gave himself as a free will offering. And upon doing so, it sent up a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Ah, and his anger toward us, his people, his children, is appeased. That's what propitiation is. We talked about this a little bit in the last stream. Look up the word propitiation, folks. It has to do with the mercy seat. And it has to do with a deity being appeased. That's what happened with, with Christ. He was the burnt offering that sent up the fragrant aroma that caused God's anger toward his people to be completely appeased. And that's why Paul says in Romans 5.1 that we have peace with God being justified by faith. We talked about that again in the, in the last stream. It even mentions there in Romans 5, the wrath of God. So I say all that to say, it may not mention the scapegoat by name, meaning the word scapegoat may not be mentioned, but the sin offering is totally depicted in the New Testament. So just do a lexical study on, uh, or search, if you will, on the sin offering in the New Testament, anything that has to do with Christ giving him, himself up for our sins. And that is essentially by proxy mentioning the scapegoat because the removal of sin was a part of the antitypical sin offering. Let's see. Any other questions? Any other questions? Got to put a cue in front of your questions, folks. It's easy to miss in the chat. Um, so it doesn't look like anything else is here. So we'll wrap it up tonight with that. Thanks for being here, folks. I think, again, like I said, this was super beneficial. Um, Jonathan, again, thank you for coming on, sir. If you're an Adventist and you would like to do this same sort of thing, answeringadventism.com, fill out the contact form on there. Also want to just continue letting people know that answeringadventism.com is live. You can donate there. You can partner with us. Um, we have a lot of interesting stuff in the works. The website is only the beginning. Um, in the fall, we've got some interesting stuff, some boots on the ground stuff that's going to start happening, some new types of content that are going to be rolling out. Um, just a bunch of stuff in the works. So if any of that stuff is your fancy, you can check all of that out. Uh, there's tons of resources there as well. You can use the super powerful search bar at the top of the website. Um, simply type in a question or even just a word like scapegoat and anything in the video or question and answer library that has to do with that will pop up. Everything is hyperlinked with all the sources. You can get lost in that all you want doing the actual digging into the sources yourself. Um, Again, Adventists, the call is always the same. It's always the same. Glad that you guys are here. Those of you that are in chat, those of you that will watch this later on, we don't hate you here. As you can see tonight, um, we can have cordial discussions, um, honest discussions without flying off the handle. If you don't come in kicking the door down, um, you're not going to be met with that same sort of energy and force. Um, we care about you. We want you to come know the truth. The Adventist church is proselytizing a false gospel. It is a false church with a false prophet, a false gospel, and a false Christ neither of which can save you when it comes to a false, well, I guess technically to a false church, but um, a false Christ and a false gospel cannot save you. The Adventist church has altered the gospel. You need to turn from the fake Jesus of Adventism, who is not real, just like the Jesus of Mormonism is not real, the Jesus of Jehovah's Witnesses, etc., is not real. Neither is the Christ of Adventism. The Bible warns us, Jesus himself says, many false Christs have already gone out into the world and many more will. Simply saying the name Jesus is not enough. The details matter. 
And when we start to examine the details of the Adventist Jesus through the great controversy theme, um, we see that it is a different Christ than the one of history and scripture. And so we want you to know the true Christ. Stick around on the channel. Um, continue to come. Continue to engage. Um, and may Christ Jesus continue to draw a people to himself. Um, he is perfectly capable and able of doing so. Um, we just pray here at Answering Adventism that he will use us for his purposes, for his glory, knowing that he is saving a people. He is drawing a people to himself. We don't have to convince people. We don't have to uh, win them with our arguments. I try to make the best arguments that I can, obviously, and seek to glorify God in the process, but God strikes straight blows with crooked sticks. I'm just asking to be used by God for his purposes, to glorify himself, for his kingdom to continue to expand. And as all of his enemies are being made a footstool, that means time is the worst enemy of Seventh-day Adventism because at some point, the organization, not all the people, the organization itself is going to be made a footstool underneath the feet of Jesus Christ because Seventh-day Adventism is an enemy of the true Christ, sending people and leading people astray after false Christ and false gospel. So again, the call is for you to leave that, come know the truth. You can always reach out, answeringadventism at gmail.com or again, over at answeringadventism.com. As always, we'll see you guys next time. God bless.